Hey dudes, welcome to Splat from the Past, the only 80s themed horror and sci-fi show where things can get totally radical. Now today, I will be welcoming back my good friend, Allison Croft, who played Baby McNulty in the original and the sequel of Trancers, the classic Charlie Band sci-fi movie. I'm having her back on today to uh, talk about this quarantine situation, um, just any random shit that pops into our heads, I guess. There's no really a big structure here. I do want to tell her about my Me Too experience that I had um, back in 2014 because I made reference to it the last time we talked and all that stuff. And I can't wait. Allison is awesome. She's amazing. She's talented. She's funny. I just adore her. I love her. She's amazing. So, uh, yeah, here is my new interview with Allison Croft. Hello. What's up, Allison? Welcome back. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> What's going on? Uh, I don't know what was going on with my phone. I don't know. It was weird. It was like, I was like, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> How you been? Yeah. Well, I've been, you know, very creative, very stressed during this whole time. Um, but, uh, but I'm keeping my sanity just by being creative, you know, um, I just, uh, podcasting like crazy. I'm procrastinating writing the script I've been wanting to write for the last three years, all this stuff. Sure. Sure. What else do you say too much? You'll be over soon and then we'll be wishing that we have, you know, time to think. Well, I'm half Italian and I'm Catholic, so that tells you something. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Well, we can do. We can do. Yeah. So, 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 so how'd your audition go? Oh, uh, it's been fun. It's been fun. It's been fun. It's taped now, even commercial. Yeah. So it's really, really interesting the way that they're trying to adapt to the situation. And, you know, hey, got to give it to them for adapting. Yeah. You know, I prefer self tapes because. Yeah, I was thinking. I was thinking the other day, like before the Me Too movement was launched. Do you th- do you think that there was uh, a virtual casting couch for virtual auditions? Virtual auditions. They're really, you know, they started self taping a lot when things started going on location. Yeah. So, um, you know, or there would be a fast turnaround, and dates would get finished, and then they'd all of a sudden be like, "Oh, well, we just need to see a self tape." And it was never like that ten years ago. Yeah. Now it's become the norm. I've never, I mean, and even friends of mine who've done a billion, kabillion commercials have never even heard of a self-consumer commercial. And then I had two this week, I believe, one this week, I think it was one this week, and it was, they were going to come to my house to shoot. That's how, and it was for a legit, I can't give out who it was for. But it was for like a legit company, and they were going to come and bring a crew to my home mm-hmm. because of the quarantine and do taping at my house. That has never happened in my life. So you know they're adapting. They're adapting hard. <laughs> they're yeah. trying whatever's going to stick. I think. Yeah, because I um, I had come up with this George Carlin esque observation about the virtual casting couch. Like you know, oh, I'd love to hear it. Let's hear it. I love George Carlin. 
you know, back in the day, all you ha- if you were a slutty actress, all you had to do was go in, take a knee, and you got the job. Now, what do you got to do? Uh-huh. Now, what do you got to do? You got to insert two fingers and say, look at me, I'm Shannon Elizabeth. Oh, boy. <laughs> Poor Shannon. Well, you know, that's true, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's the only thing I could think of, you know, and this was pre Me Too, you know. Now it's now it's like you got to watch, you got to watch it. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was watching a, I was watching a comedian. I, I had never heard of him before, but it was a Netflix thing, and it was uh, something about, you know, the Me Too thing. Like, mm-hmm. I won't even bring up the subject of intimacy unless the girl brings it up first and then I ask three times are you sure you're okay are you sure you're okay are you sure you're okay and then there was another bit on um Will and Grace that I think it was uh what's the guy from excuse me from Friends Schwimmer David Schwimmer David Schwimmer and one of the yeah one of the lines was uh, he was trying to get her to get intimate with him mm-hmm. and then it finally he stopped and he goes what am I talking about this, this is 2018. I'm not trying to convince you of anything. Forget it. I'm not trying to convince you. Because she said, okay, you're convincing me to, you know, want to get into that or whatever. He's like, I'm not convincing you. I'm not trying to convince you. Yeah. So there's just sense of hysteria when it comes to it. But, you know, I think it's always going to be there. But I'm <laughs> glad for the voices that are speaking out. Because a lot of really, really scandalous things have gone on. Mm-hmm. I yeah. Last time I was I was, I was going to tell you the, um, about my Me Too um, experience that I had back in uh, 2014. Um, it was a, it was. I a t- remember you t- you said let me tell you it another time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh-huh. It was uh, you know 2014 was a dark year for me. Um, I was hitting the bottle pretty bad because my mom and I we just lost everything financially at the end of 2013. It was a bad year, and um, I had to live in this shitty rundown friggin halfway house is what it was pretty much and uh there was an attendant there uh she um she was giving me shit for like i was there for three months and like she was giving me shit like most of the time only because she liked me and i didn't like her back and i was just going through a lot of darkness in my life and i just didn't have any time for bullshit and um Mm -hmm. This one night, you know, she had my number because I had to give her my number because um, she had to. Um, I had to like let her know when I was coming home because I was working uh, the swing shift from four uh, four p.m. to eleven to twelve a.m. Um, as a security guard. I had to let her know um, what I was doing and stuff. And like, she. Um, was just uh, she was just getting really weird and stuff, you know. And I called her out and everything. And then a few nights later, when I was at work, she like sent me um, a text message of apology and that she, she's sorry that she's been giving me shit and everything. So I go to bed. So I oh no, so I go I go home that night. Actually, I was not working um, this this one particular night. I was actually out drinking uh, with a friend. And, um, I, I woke up the next morning. I, I, my, my routine was the same every day when I was there. I got up at 7 a.m., took a quick shower, got dressed and got on the 745 bus, um, out of town. That's what I did every day. And so, um, I waking up at 7 a.m. and I felt like I was dreaming. I, I could have swore in this, in this dream, someone was kissing me. And making out with me and I woke up she was kissing me and making out with me and she was giving me a hand job simultaneously okay. yeah and wow. I told and she oh god she was just saying things she was whispering things like just relax you know and all this yeah. stuff and I was like could you please stop this <laughs> I I like the attention, but no, this is this is not going to work for us. And she said, "I'm not I'm not stopping until you have an orgasm." So I was terrified. So I just thought I I thought of somebody hot, and I had an orgasm, and then that was that. And first thing I did when I got up 
took a shower, got dressed and left. I told my mother, I told friends. I mean, I just told everybody, right? So luckily I had a friend who um, let me stay with him for a couple of nights. And ironically, this was the last week I was in that house too. I was getting out the next week. So thank God it happened later instead of at the very beginning, because I would I, I don't know what would have happened. I mean, in the beginning when I was there, I had another friend who I was staying with a lot. And then he ended up um, moving back to Minnesota um, about a month before I moved out, you know. So anything could have happened. So um, I stay with my um, friend for a couple of days. And then I stay there one more night just because I'm going to pack up the next day and get out. And normally I was the last one to leave the house uh, by 730. And everyone left probably by 7. And they were all waiting for me. And I was like, this is fucking weird, right? This is just the weirdest fucking thing ever. Like, what, 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 why are they, what, what, they have like a, a surprise party for me or something? Like, what the fuck are they waiting for? You know, they're all out there, uh, like, waiting for me. And then um, the guy who, who owned the place came out uh, to me and he says, I heard, uh, you, I heard you sexually harassed uh, whatever her name was or something, right? And I was like, whoa, 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 wait a fucking minute. I wake up to her making out with me and I'm the creep. You know, I wake up to uh, her giving me a hand job, and I'm the creep. And, he, and he's like, did that really happen? And I was like, yes, it did. And then he's like, all right, well, I'm not going to I'm not gonna cause any more trouble for you since you're leaving now and shit, but uh, I'll have a talk with her about that. And then uh, I got the hell out of there, never looked back. And then about two years ago, I found out, the place got shut down, and all the places that that guy owned got shut down because of human trafficking. Excuse Yeah. It was fucking insane. I told everybody about it. I made a Facebook status talking about it and shit, and I got all these likes because I had never shared that story with, with, with anybody before. Um, I, actually, I think I had told it a couple times on, on here, but that was about it. But like everyone, I told everyone about it and just how scary it was. And just like, I couldn't believe it, you know, and this human trafficking had been going on for like eight, 11 years, something like that. It'd been going on for a long time. And my mom said, we got to sue the city for letting me stay there, you know, and what's that? Were you underage? I, I wasn't underage, no. <laughs> I was 31 at the time. But still, it's just, it was it was scary, you know? Oh, yeah, I mean, I don't know what to say. All okay. right, thank you for sharing. Uh, it's horrifying. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty horrifying, you know? And um, I've tried to, like, keep up to date to, like, what, what happened to them and what their punishment was and stuff. I haven't heard very much, but I hope they're going to jail for a very long time. And the people who, um, were staying there, they had been staying there for over 20 years, and, like, they weren't questioned, and it's not like they were. A lot of them are, um, uh, mentally unstable and everything, so I'm sure they probably did interview them, but couldn't get, um, you know, enough out of them or whatever. But it was, yeah, it was terrifying. And, yeah, that, I, I'm, I'm haunted by the year 2014 every day. Just uh, just things that I got myself into when I was drinking, things that, that, that happened to me like that. I mean, it was a devastating year. It's, it's one of those years I wish I could do over again, you know, and correct all the mistakes I made, you know. But yeah. I grew from them. That's important. <clears throat> All we can do, or use it in our art in some way. Right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I'm sure, we don't ever let anyone feel that way. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry that happened to you. Oh, it's it's, a, it's all right, but at least I made you laugh a little bit. <laughs> well, it's not really a funny story. So yeah. Of, what do I do? I don't know. I don't yeah. really react to that. 
And I had a, um, and I also had a false Me Too accusation happen to me that was very brief that uh, I, I would have brought up to you last time, but we would have been on the phone another hour with it. It was it was pretty bad. Um, okay, so I've been doing stand-up comedy in the Bay Area since since 2006, and uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of wannabe comedians out there that are just assholes. I mean, real assholes. And this and um, after um, <clears throat> the whole Weinstein thing happened, and then Louis C.K. thing happened, and all this stuff. Next thing I know, people uh, who are comedians in the Bay Area start unfriending me on Facebook. And I'm just, like, asking why to them. And they're saying, oh, if you show your face around here, sucker, you're going to live to regret it and all this shit. And I'm like, what the fuck is going on? And then uh, this one comedian who I've been rivals with for years, he's, he mouthed off um, on Facebook. And he didn't think I would see it, but I saw it. He was uh, saying all this shit, saying... That I did something, I did something lewd uh, to to some female comedian or something like that, and I was like, okay, so he's making the story up. That's what the f- the problem is. He's making it up. So I just called him out. We had a big old war that everyone saw. It was ugly. I was considering legal action. I was really really pissed and shit. And then later in the year, all these female comedians who didn't even know about this. Uh, who had been on my podcast started unfriending me, and I and I and I asked one of them why, and she was like, "Oh, I heard uh, uh, what you did to this female comedian, blah blah blah." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" You know, and then this other uh, comedian that doesn't like me, who I actually <clears throat> banned him from an open mic that I was hosting because he was doing all these rape jokes in which all these women were like throwing popcorn at him. He uh, does it to me too on Instagram and I had to block him because he was doing it. He was commenting on my picture saying this horrible stuff. Right. And then finally a month ago, I finally got closure, but it's still not closure enough. This one comedian I'm friends with, I hadn't talked to him in quite a while. He says, did you, did you know that a female comedian went up on stage and did a bit about you uh, doing something to her, and I'm like, no, what? And he's and, and he says, yes, yeah, apparently uh, she was driving you back from a, a from an open mic and um, you masturbated in yeah. front of her. Yeah. You hello. Yeah. 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 So, oh, did you? So, did you hear that part? No, I didn't hear the, that part. Oh, okay. So, he said that this female comedian was on stage saying that. Um, I was driving, I was, uh, this female comedian was driving me back from an open mic and I masturbated in front of her. That's what he said, that she said. And I was like, no female comedian has ever given me a ride in a car, let alone from an open mic, ever, you know? So I'm like, who the, who the fuck was that? And he's like, I only saw her one time. I will tell you this, though, half the room was booing her and the other half was 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 either laughing or just talking shit but he says a lot of people were on your side and she got booed off the stage and i'm like okay but who said that you know it's weird yeah what i said i don't have a response for you other than ouch yeah there's people out there, you know, they, these uh, bandwagoners, these gross people, you know, it's it's disgusting. Oh, there are a lot of gross people out there, that's for sure. Got to just keep it classy whenever you can, I guess. I don't know. I'm not saying you didn't do anything. I'm just saying anybody. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I can't speak to any of that because I don't know any of those people. So. Yeah. They're all garbage. I can tell you they're all garbage. It's a business stand-up. It's a tough business to put yourself out there and, you know, people are going to love you, hate you, say whatever they want about you, and then say it's a joke or not a joke. I don't know. Yeah. I love comedians, though. It's a tough job. They're great on stage. They're horrible backstage, I can tell you that. There's, (laughs) There's so many comedians that... I, I, I don't like off stage, but there's a handful of really great ones, especially out in L.A. that I'm friends with, and they will go to war for me. Aw, that's nice. 
yes. I'm very lucky in that regard. But for the most part, so many of them, they're, they're broken, deranged people for the most part. <laughs> you know? I don't do stand-up, so I have yet to know that world exactly. I support them, but... But you do that thing you were telling me about the, uh, what was it, the Hollywood progressives comedy thing? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we did a great one in uh, February, February 29th. It was fantastic. It was so much fun. You know, the thing I loved about it was that there was an audience of people that never would have
shitty Redding, California. Well, we were in California, though. Well, mom, my mom and I, we were going to come down. I must not be having a good day. I'm sorry. What? <laughs> I said, you must not be having a good day. Every time I ask you something, you're like shitty running California. No, it's just, uh, uh, just I, I, I want to be in LA so bad. And my mom and I, we were, um, uh, we were gonna come down uh, for the first week of May because Monster Palooza and the Hollywood Show was scheduled in the same weekend, and that never happens ever. And we were looking forward to it. We were just oh, excited, you know. I was actually gonna message you and see if you uh, wanted to have dinner with us. Fun. You know, I really want to go to one of these, like, you know, where the where the full nude people are. I know he does wacky little movie, movies now. I mean, he's always done wacky films, but nowadays I know they're quite over the top. Mm-hmm. But, um, Charlie Band, I mean. Yeah. No, so, I mean, I'm going to go to one of these things. I talked to Tim yesterday, actually, and, you know, it's like, I'm going to go to one of these, like, comic con kind of places, and, I don't know. Never even thought about it before. I, well, yeah, I watched uh, Transfers again the other night, and uh, I, I, I just, I, I can't believe just how well beyond your years you were. Aw, yeah. I look at my son, and I think the same thing. To be honest with you, he's eight, and it's like I could not imagine him on set. It would be a disaster. <laughs> I think I might have been around that age when when I shot it. I can't remember how old I was exactly, but. Oh, there's no way. I mean, maybe boys and girls are different, but, you know, oh, no way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He's a great actor. Like, he'll read, he'll do self tapes with me, actually. Mm-hmm. Really? Rear. <laughs> My <laughs> stuff. And in a pickle, and I can't get a friend to come over to, like, read the lines with me. Or I can't get them on, like, my messenger to read with me while I'm on the phone. Like, while I'm being taped, like, they'll be on messenger on my computer. Mm-hmm. They sound a bit robotish, but at least I have a an adult human being and then there's times where I have to use my phone and I'm like okay get serious kid and and it's like I'm in tears or whatever the scene calls for and you know he's reading the lines the man in the camera and you know and he's like you know, I'm like I'm sorry I'm put pressure on you but you're a fantastic actor he really is great he just couldn't handle the, the life of uh, you know you kind of got to be a mini adult when you're, when you're a kid, after. Yeah. Like, I, it, off, you know, can't be throwing balls around and dithering around and stuff. You know, you just, just get your mark, shut up, say your line, do it, don't mess up the shot. And, you know, do your thing and be dead. Yeah. I just love it when, when you say, say, who's the skirt? <laughs> oh, yeah. I think I say that one in the third slash second one. Uh-huh. Something I, I made up a line. I remember I made up a line. A leading, and, uh, I remember that because that was such a part of the first one. Mm-hmm. I think I made up something along the lines of "Hey, listen, good, Lena." Like something along the lines to kind of have that to tie that in. I do remember doing that. The rest of the movie was kind of a wash, but you know, um, I do remember trying to have those qualities in it. You know. And I've talked to Mark before about it, and he's, you know, he's trying to talk to me. I wish I, I wish I could do another one now and really get while well, we're still all alive. Another one, um, <laughs> to to really get behind, like, you know, let's sit down. We never really sat down for like an hour, and he gave me like, you know, in depth kind of talk about what it's like to be a now. Yeah. Like I got, I got certain gestures. I got, you know, we talked about certain things, but we didn't really get a chance to kind of have that, like, you know, that real talk about character that much. Stuff, stuff that I'd be interested in. Uh, I was interested in Seventeen, but nobody kind of had the time. Uh, very rushed. The production was very rushed. And, yeah. You know, it was kind of. Um, yeah, I don't really know. You know, I mean, the movie turned out bad for what it was. Um, I think he was, Charlie was on a mission to just kind of get, like, a four of movies out before he died. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, I 
I might be interviewing Richard Hurd soon. And which criminal team? That's not so familiar. I'm sorry. Chair, Chairman, uh, Chairman Spencer, he looked like Carl Malden. Chair, uh, Chairman Spencer, at the beginning of the movie, it's him, Thelma Hopkins, uh, and Art LaFleur. Is he one of the council people? Yes. Who Francis? And he was on that sci-fi show V, which, by the way, reminds me of this whole quarantine. <laughs> oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. So crazy, they come back and it's Yeah. <laughs> I did just interview um, Mark Arnold, who was in Transfers 4 and 5, and he told me he'd never even seen the first three, and I told him about you and Art LaFleur and um, every, and, the, and everyone in, in the movie and stuff. And I said, I said, seeing the first one is the only one worth seeing, I told him. You know, it really is. I, I watched it the other, the, not too long ago, my son wanted to watch it. He was and I figured, well, you know, people like that stuff at eight. He's a boy. I thought he might like it, you know. And so like, this reminds me of what's the zombie show that everybody loves. Uh, the Walking Dead. Yeah. You know, there's a little bit of element of that. And then, you know, um, hearing Tarantino talk about it, did you hear him talk about it? Uh, no, but Tarantino talks about everything, so I'm not surprised. <laughs> well, he really, you know, there was this thing that was sent, and it was him talking about transfers, but he was talking about it in a way as if he had just watched it yesterday. Like, he was bringing up lines and quotes and, you know, the and, and, you know, how that particular film kind of touched on a lot of things. Yeah. Things that were really great ideas when it comes to time travel. And they're so, they use every convention in all of these movies. Jumanji, you know, the bunch mm-hmm. of into another character. You know, all of these ideas that were not used back then. You know, and at the time, I guess it was considered a off of Terminator and Blade Runner, but... It wasn't. It was like a film noir kind of, you know, who was the, not Stacey Keach, but that kind of, you know, who's the skirt? You know, like that whole kind of, <laughs> that thing, though, that, uh, 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 that's the wrong person. I'm so bad with names. Like, it's kind of like that, like that kind of flavor to it. And like, just even the set design was, was awesome. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, I don't even remember even, even remember that part. Yeah. Um, and the fact that it took place in Chinatown. Yeah, the earthquake. It had to have been an earthquake that sunk America. That sunk Los Angeles. I think there's so many things in the movie that were so Absolutely. You know what, you know what, too? I mean, if, if Tim didn't do the new one, you know, they could have, like, Jack Death's son that he didn't even know he had, like, take over Next Generation. And I know the perfect guy who could play him. Uh, this, this, this actor, I know, he's, he's a couple years younger than I am. His name is Ben Kaplan. Um, he's a stand-up comedian out there in L.A., and he, he's a working actor. He's in a lot of shit. I think he could handle... Uh, play, playing a, a sci-fi hero with his, his sarcasm that he has. He's hilarious. Right. Wow, I don't know who Ben Chaplin is, but yeah. Ben Kaplan, yeah. yeah. He, pe- yeah. The whole world needs to know him, but he's, he's a really talented guy. <laughs> um, he did this uh, horror film a couple of years ago, which is how I found out about him. Um, it was called, uh, 
what was it called? Slasher.com or something like that. It was about, you know, the dangers of online dating. Um, it was kind of a Texas Chainsaw Massacre type of movie. It takes place in, in a rural area. And he's he dates this girl who's, who's white trash. And Jewel Shepard plays her mother. And she's always holding this spoon. And she does creepy things with it, including pleasuring herself with it. It's really, really funny. Okay. It's well, dark. It's it, it's a yeah. dark, dark movie. And it's really funny. Uh-huh. And... Um, yeah. Exorcist-esque. Exorcist-esque. I didn't think about that one, but sure. (laughs) But sure, yeah. And, uh, yeah, so he's a really good actor and stuff. I think he did um, um, a a series for NBC um, about a year or two ago that didn't last or something. I I, I can't remember. Or he at least did a pilot for them. And, um, yeah, he's out there working all the time. Oh, wow, that's great. That's great. I mean, I was thinking if they came back in quarantine time and say, you know, say Jack Death has has the COVID, mm-hmm. and then somehow, you know, of course I'm thinking about myself, right? But mm-hmm. anyway, uh, so on the floor comes back to me, and I've got like six kids, and like you know, it opens on me breastfeeding, <laughs> and he's like. <laughs> What the hell happened to this girl? Geez, she took a hard left. You know, like, what, what's going on here? She's got, like, seven different dads, you know, to her kids or whatever. And she's like, oh, my God, I had to get out of there. Oh, my God. This. And blah, 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 blah. And then it goes on to this whole thing. And, you know. <laughs> When I told when I told Mark Arnold ab- about how in the first in the first two you know Art Lafleur uh, comes back in in the form of a little girl, he laughed out loud and said, "Why why did they get rid of that? That should have been in our movie. It would have made it so much better." <laughs> oh, yeah, I know, I know. It was great. It was just a great. It was just a great thing to be able to do that. And then um, you know, then I grew up, but then I still play that role like that really did a lot of shaping for me yeah uh, you know to not play the typical like you know oh i'm a victim i'm a i'm a you know please me man please me you know it always gave me a little bit more grit to my work yeah i I always kind of appreciated it for that and you know how cool oh yes i played a man in that movie how old are you I was eight. <laughs> what? Yeah. I just, you know, I wish they had gone on to do better and better films because that film did have really good um, elements to it. it really did. Mm-hmm. So too bad that they didn't really carry on with that. Yeah, I, I remember when I saw you. I saw you in something like twenty years ago when you when you were older, and I was just like, "Oh my God, she she has grown up not only to be beautiful, but oh my God, she still has those the same lips that she had when she was little." <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. This is sweet. Yeah. Yeah, and the, and the best part is you haven't gotten Botox. And I have, and I have talked. Oh, please don't! I have talked to a lot of people who've had Botox, and I just want to say to them, why you you you're so gorgeous without them, you know. Well, you know, aging does a number on women. And it's a tough one. We don't age as well as men. It's hard because my parents never. Filled in me that the value of, of me was skin deep. Mm-hmm. So it was like, you're never going to be the prettiest girl in the world, in the room, but you're going to work harder than the rest of me. You know, mm-hmm. your value is going to be in how hard you work and that you're going to work harder and that you're always going to be growing and you're always going to be trying new things and doing different things. And it's not, you know. Had I not had that, I may have turned out a little bit differently. Like, consumed with looks and aging and you know, I don't want to get old but you know at the same time it's inevitable mm-hmm. what do they call that the, the, our elusive enemy who will never win against time yeah 
Do, do you know Holly Fields? Yeah. I remember her from back in the day. Yeah, I think she's had some, some work done on her lips and stuff. You know, she's she's been on the show, and she's an absolute sweetheart. I adore her, you know, but I think she's had something uh, done to her lips because she does not look like she did when she was younger. Oh, well, you know, everybody takes their own, their own road. I, I, I don't know. I know a lot of girls that have, don't even look close to what they used to look like, or even, you can't even look, you look at them and you're like, who are you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember you because you look nothing the same. And then I have other girlfriends that look, it, it's like, if you took a snapshot of us in sixth grade, we still look the same, like Jenny Lewis. Like, mm-hmm. you know, we were good friends for such a long time, and we still look exact, like almost exactly the same. Um, you know, but that's also genetics too. I mean, some people just get very consumed with, you know, how they look and I care. I mean, I I don't care, but, um, you Mm know, it's a, it's a rough road and as you get older, you speed up. It's almost like we're, it's like somebody pressed the fast forward button. I didn't have that gray hair yesterday. (laughs) Yeah. That argument I had was, so, you know. Yeah, my my hair has been receding for the last decade. I have lost so much hair in the in the front, and just my hair on the sides is gross. It's it's gray. I just I have to constantly dye my hair um, and just cut it, and it just it just looks gross. I'm going to be shaving my head completely bald, you know, next few years. You know, and I don't mind. You got it too. You got it too. It's yeah. That's the only thing I can equate women and men and their insecurities about their looks is men with their hair and women with every other part of their body. Mm-hmm. <laughs> every other part. You know, but men can understand when it comes to hair. You know? Yeah. And you just proved that point in space. So, you know, it's hard. It's just a hard thing when you get older. But, you know, I've been lucky enough to where, you know, I can clean up pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> Not in a jerky way, but, you know, if I had to, and I, you know, I do. So that's nice. Lucky genetics. I think my parents would have us so much easier. Yeah, well, you've posted uh, pictures of your mother, and you, you definitely look like her. Oh, she was so lovely. My mama. Mm-hmm. Yeah, she gave a lot for me to be uh, you know, a child professional. And, uh, you know, and I work with kids now, too, coaching, mm-hmm. which, keeps, you know, which keeps me oiled up because I'm constantly coaching. So I'm constantly, you know, character analyzing and script analyzing and, you know, going through the who, what, when, why, if, and all, all of that stuff. And you see these preparedness and you're like, you know, I like to incorporate a parent class so you don't end up with an unhealthy relationship with your kid. Right. Super important because parents, moms tend to, you know, there's so many different ways they can go. They can completely forget about themselves and pour everything into their kid. Mm -hmm. And then when it's time for your kid to grow up and move on, you're like, I'm spent. I gave everything to my child and now I've let myself go. Or I've said things to my kid that I wouldn't necessarily say to my kid if my kid wasn't an actor. Right. I mean, I had a woman client the other day that was just beaten up on her little, you know, nine-year-old. Not literally, but um, verbally. I'm like, you can't be in the room, honey. You can't, no. Speak, no. Speaking of kid actors, did you see that... Um documentary about uh, Corey Haim, Corey Feldman? You know, I didn't get to because it was a paid thing and it was on some weird channel and I just assumed that it would be released at something. And I know there was a screening, but I couldn't make it to the screening. Yeah, I have a friend who went to the screening out there. And um, so this is what what, what me and my mother did. We paid $20 to, to see it on that um, on on the internet thingy, 
and um, someone was trying to stop it from happening. And so a lot, uh -huh. a lot of people didn't get to see it, but I got to see it bootlegged on YouTube the next day before they took it down. And it was a waste of time. Everything was basically rehashed of things that I've heard him say in other interviews. There was there was nothing new. All they were saying was all he said that Charlie Sheen, you know, uh, molested uh, Corey Haim on the set of Lucas. And I've heard that story before, but I don't believe it. I mean, okay. First of all, who am I to say what happened to him? It's not my story to tell. It wasn't Corey Feldman. Right. I mean, I, I'm, I, I'm not with the guy. Are we hanging out? Are we buddies? No. Did we hang out? Yes. Go to the same house and set up up Yes. You know, there was a group of us, and it was a really wonderful time for some of us. Obviously, it wasn't a great time for him. You know, but who am I to say? I just know it's really hard for him to longer around. Mm -hmm. Tell their story. Now, if he's put in his will, hey, hey, Corey, can you tell the story for me? If God forbid something happens to me, then go right ahead. But I, I don't know. It's just the story I did here. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, is it true? I have no idea. Who am I, who am I to know? I don't, I mean, it sounds kind of far fetched, but, you know, hey, crazy things have happened. Who knows? I don't know. I think Charlie Sheen's hilarious. I'm sorry. Yeah. I mean, is it a perfect life? No, it's not. But, you know, I still think he's a talented guy. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, what, what am I going to do? You know, I think I always, you know, some people do shoot, and, you know, they suck as actors. Okay, well. Yeah. They suck, and they suck as actors. So, hey, talk all the shit you want. Sometimes the people who are really just talented actors are kind of a, you know, I'm a little bit more able to compartmentalize a little bit. Yeah. Except, except when it comes to Trump. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, like everybody. everybody. Yeah, like everybody, yeah. <laughs> Oh my God! Uh, I mean, there's no redeeming there. I mean, you know, Charlie Sheen was from Iowa for two and a half years. Where are you? Uh, he was great in um, Ferris Bueller. Oh, oh God! I went to the 30th anniversary screening of Ferris Bueller, and oh, yeah? people were hysterically rolling when he came on screen, and he said that he had been in, arrested for drugs. Everybody howled. <laughs> Yeah. To turn that switch to like to be in love with this guy now. And his whole energy changed. If he wasn't good so good in that role, mm -hmm. it wouldn't have made sense for her to make that shit. And he did a great job, I thought. Yeah. I bet he outside the box on that one. Je Jennifer Gray, another one who had a nose job and she used to be a lot cuter, I think. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were together. They were going to get married. But he wasn't mm -hmm. engaged to it at a certain point. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so, you know, she goes on calls and they're like, well, oh, she's not really pretty enough for this girl. She's not really pretty enough for this girl. I'm sure she got that. Even with that huge film into her belt. Mm -hmm. And it may have been something personal for her that she really hated about herself. So don't do you. You change your face. And it changed her whole look. And no one was like, oh, it's not baby anymore. It's not that a weird looking girl that's cute. But she never quite got the chance to redeem herself as an actor. To be like, it's not about my nose, it's about me being an actor. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. So, uh, Renee Zellweger pulled herself out of it and said, listen, guys, it's still a fantastic actress, even though I. 
showed up, right? Yeah. She's pretty talented. Very talented woman. I just don't think that it's a very tight spot, 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 I'm not a big fan of Dirty Dancing, you know, like a lot of people are, but she was a good actress. I love that movie. Of course, I'm a girl, but I love that movie. Oh, I can... 13, so oh, oh, I lo- like... Oh, I like... Right in those years. Oh, there are girl movies I like. Like, I'm a big fan of um, that one that came out about 25 years ago, Now and Then. That with all the, like, Rosie O'Donnell... And, um... Demi Moore and Melanie Griffith, Rita Wilson, and then they have uh, Christina Ricci, Thora Birch, Gabby Hoffman, and then that girl who died a couple years ago. Yeah, playing them when, when playing them when they were like twelve. Yeah, it, yeah, it's it's a great movie. It's like the, it's like the female Stand by Me. You know, I've never seen it. Yeah, you should see it. It's great. I I might put that on the list. I I think it's on Netflix. Pretty much. I think it is on Netflix, too. Oh, that'd be fun, too. Good. Something good to watch. Thank you for giving me something to look forward to, Johnny. I appreciate that. Oh, my pleasure. I just hope it happens. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure I'll find it somewhere. It's something I haven't seen. And you're, you're right. I should have probably seen it at some point. Yeah, I was in seventh grade, I think, when I first saw it. And I just, uh, I could relate to it, you know. And plus, I love, you know, 70s nostalgia you know, I have parents who grew up in the 60s and 70s. I grew up listening to their music, so it was a movie I could relate to. That's so cool. It's, I love the 70s, too. Yeah. I think that's why I'm so obsessed with, like, Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy? Really? <laughs> well, you know, the documentaries, and then that one with the girl's head giving her account of what happened, that one that was just released. Wow, that was I, I interviewed a couple of girls who were in the um, the uh, TV movie about Ted Bundy with Mark Harmon. Mark Harmon. They all told me they were in love with him during filming. He was just the nicest, most charming guy, and they just they just he they just they just adored him. But you know, I've heard Mark Harmon say in interviews he had friends who were terrified uh, of him for a long time. But I thought it was such a cool casting choice. <coughs> Mark Harmon, the most likable guy. Summer school. I mean, how do we get out of summer school? Oh, oh God! I just re- remembered uh, Robin Thomas, who plays the asshole principal Gills. He mm-hmm. was supposed to do the show, and I haven't uh, heard back from him. And I've just I've kept emailing him, you know, uh, not you know not pestering him, but just email him, and I haven't gotten a word back. I hope he's okay. You know, I'm trying to think of people that, that you'd be interested in uh, talking to that I know. So mm-hmm. maybe we'll do that off um, off the podcast and maybe go down a list and see if I can help you out and find some people that I know would be uh, would have fun doing it because you're so good. And oh, would thank probably you. would be interested in doing that. Oh, yeah. Um, there's, there's plenty of people. Um, I even posted last night... Uh, uh, do, uh, do, do you know this one actress, Shelby Leverington? No, sorry, she was an older, yeah, she's an older actress. Um, she did this horror movie in 1971 that every time I bring it up, no one's ever seen it. It's called Death by Invitation. She was a gorgeous hippie chick in that movie, and then she she has aged considerably since then. But she's a very talented actress, and she should be working more than she does. 
and I'm I, I, she's on Facebook, but uh, she hasn't read my message, so that's why I'm checking to see if anybody knows her, so uh, I can get connected, you know. Hey, Kelly, you know the only one that I actually have some sort of um, that was in a hit that was in Sixteen Candles, and I don't know if you've already interviewed her or not, but the one that plays all oh, sexy girlfriends. Remember her? Uh, not Leanne, right? Leanne Curtis? I'm not sure her name. Uh, the one on the bicycle, the one that was the, the Asian guy's girlfriend for the night. Oh, uh, Haviland Morris? No. No, no. I, 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 I've emailed um, Haviland Morris, and she turned me down for now, she said. Which, which one was Haviland Morris? But... She was uh, uh, she was Caroline. Um, who did she end up with in the I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I've seen the movie. Oh, my God. I could recite that movie back. Like, you know, I'm a, I'm a John Hughes girl. So. Oh, me, oh, I'm a big John Hughes guy. Um, yeah. I, I just interviewed the other day the fat girl in the bathroom in Weird Science. Okay. You remember? Okay. Um, okay. yeah. Suzanne Snyder and Judy Orenson, they leave and while the, while the two guys are, you know, in the uh, bathroom. Oh, was it the shower? Yeah, they're in the shower. They look and there's two fat girls there. The blonde one, Mary Steele Smith, was on the show on Monday. She is a sweetheart. And she told me the reason why she got cast in, in that role um, is because she had done a movie for Universal a few years before, a horror movie. And... Mm -hmm. The casting, it was the same casting director. She's like, I haven't I haven't put you in a movie in a while, and you were so likable in that movie. I need to uh, um, put you in, in, in a movie again so people will know you're still alive, that you didn't die in that movie. <laughs> yeah. That's so sweet. I wish more casting people were that way now. Yeah. See a little bit more that way. There was sort of a, a bond, a loving bond, you know, between casting and actors. Well, there's a woman in New York. I forget her name. Um, I've, I've heard about her quite a bit. Um, she will give anybody a chance, even if they have zero credits on their resume. Um, if, if someone goes to her and say that I want to be an actor, she will do her best to put you even in the background of something. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Well, I wish I could remember this girl's name. Uh, you better remember her. I mean, she was the integral part of that movie. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at the um, the what you call the Wikipedia right now, but I probably have to go to um, IMDb. IMDb, yeah. Yeah, so I'll. I, mean, I can make a phone call because I know her manager very well, and I are almost best friends. So Ugh. I'm sure she'd be interested in doing something. I gotta be careful with managers. There's a bunch of them that I'm on their shit list, and they're on my shit list. <laughs> Oh. Um, yeah, I mean, she's a really, I've met her a couple times at Christmas parties and stuff like that. I just remember her as that, and I'm like, oh my gosh, they were the best movie ever. Let's that's see. just a kid in me, you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to see it's it. It's just a fan in me. Because the, the, the two uh, women that I have interviewed from 16 Candles are Leanne Curtis and Elaine Wilkes. And... The one guy is John Capolis, who's the janitor in The Breakfast Club. I've interviewed him twice. Amazing. Yeah. He's an amazing actor. Very nice That's guy, him. too. Yeah. He, I get him mixed up with Chris Mahoney a, a few times, but he is <laughs> so good. And he pops up so many different places, you know, the longevity of his career. He just pops up. Oh, my God. So... He just pops up. Someone someone tagged him in a post uh, a couple weeks ago and uh, was talking about his performance in The Breakfast Club and how he makes it a, a great move, an already great movie, much better, right? And I commented saying, yeah, I interviewed the uh, gym teacher that was cut out of the movie who was supposed to be his love interest. And oh. John responded with, Tommy, what's her name? I haven't seen her since since we shot that, I, and I remember her. And I said, Karen Lee Hopkins. And he's like, that's right, that's right. Yeah, she's she became a screenwriter. Oh, very cool. 
Yeah, she wrote that Winona Ryder movie, Welcome Home, Roxy Carmichael. Wow, because it came out when you were a teenager, then like I'm sure all the teenagers in your age group were like, "This movie is awesome." <laughs> I'm sure they were, but I don't know how. You know, me and uh, I think I may have told you this before. I don't know if I did or not, but it was between me and another writer for Fuel Juice. Yeah, I think I did. You tell me that story. I don't remember. I'm, I'm sure I did. It's not a long story. It's just that's just kind of my luck in this business. It's kind of been like. Mm -hmm. I never quite got that one big job that just took you right over the edge where I didn't really have to, like, you know, just the one. So, for example, like, a few years back, Ray Liotta did a, did a series mm -hmm. for the guy who do, <coughs> did ER, um, Southland, uh, P, not Peace of the Kingdom. Um, what's the name of this one that's out now? Animal Kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, John Well. Okay. Famous, big, big time TV. Animal Planet? Producer. No, not Animal Planet. No, Animal oh. Kingdom with um, Ellen Burstyn. Oh, okay. Uh, it's, a brilliant, it's a brilliant show. It's so good. But anyway, he does a lot of shows. He did ER. He did all these kinds of shows. And he did a show with Ray Liotta as a star. So it was Ray Liotta. It was Virginia Madsen. Um, and I was up for the pilot. So they called me in, I met everybody, and I didn't end up get booked in the pilot. The third episode they're casting for uh, to play something to do with, like, I don't know what it was. It was like I was in an alcoholic the AA group, and I was whatever. Anyway, they called me back and said, we want her to recur on this show now. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my God, my luck has come in. Thank God. Like, how often does that happen? Well, then they were like, we want her on hold for next week. Thursday. We're going to shoot next week, Thursday. Well, then I called back and I said, have we heard anything? And she goes, oh, sorry, the show got canceled. Wow. So, I'm like, hey, I look, it's not so great, but I'm thinking, who cancels a show with Ray Liotta? Who would think a show with Ray Liotta is not going to get a full season at least? They pulled the show after the third episode. So that would have been a show I would have been recurring on if it had gone. Whoa. So that's just another example of my kind of uh, certain things that don't necessarily go my way. So I've had my, you know, my, my knocks and my, my hits. So back to Winona Ryder, and I may not have been like, oh, I'm going to run out and film, <coughs> you know, mm -hmm. that's the Beetlejuice thing. That was just my own personal thing. But I love Winona, Winona Ryder. I think she's great on Stranger Things. Yeah. I've liked her in almost everything I've seen her in. When she did uh, the Ab Sandler movie, Mr. Deeds, I think she was I think she was coming off, or it was just before her shoplifting scandal, uh, one of the two. And I thought she did a great job doing, you know, kind of, you know, lowbrow comedy, you know, because she's always doing really sophisticated, you know, drama. Or, and if she does comedy, it's kind of, you know... Um, it's kind of dark comedy, but she got to do some some quirky lowbrow comedy, and I thought she did a great job. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I've always liked her. I've always liked her. I think she did singles and shit, and then you know, I thought that shoplifting scandal was hilarious. I mean, you know, hey, we're, we're not all above it, you know. Yeah. I hope someday she gives an interview where she elaborates on it because I'm just thinking to myself, she's rich. She doesn't need to shoplift. <laughs> no, of course not. But that's not what, uh, you know, people who have compulsions, they're not really doing it for reasonable reasons. Mm -hmm. It's a compulsion, I guess. You know who else had a shoplifting scandal, but no one cared because he was he was a one-hit wonder, was uh, Zach Galligan in Gremlins. Yeah, he got um, he, he he got a shoplifting scandal like around, around the same time she did, but no one cared. <laughs> Poor guy. What was he shoplifting? Food or I don't I don't like, remember. High I, ticket items. I don't even remember what Winona shoplifted. <laughs> well, she was shoplifting. I don't even know like sweaters. I, I was it diamonds? <laughs> was it jewelry? I I don't know. 
I don't know. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was not necessities. It wasn't like she was feeling a purple bread because she needed to eat. It was, you know, a whole different kind of thing. Yeah, but speaking, um, but speaking of gre- yeah. but speaking of gremlins, yeah, Christmas time. I was trying to pound the pavement, trying to get some gremlins guests on the show, including him. And for the second year in a row, he didn't respond to me. And then um, I remember I, I reached out to Chris Wayless, who created all the mo- the monsters for the movie. And he told me, I would love to do your show, but I'm a little hard of hearing and I'm single. I don't have anyone to like, you know, be an interpreter. But if I wasn't hard of hearing, I would do your show. And I thought that was very, very nice. Oh, that's super nice. Mm-hmm. You could figure out a way to do it. Maybe have somebody do it on computer and then voice him. Yeah, well, I, I used to do email interviews. Um, the first year that I was doing the show, I was doing um, some email interviews for people who didn't have time. And after about three, I just I didn't have the energy to like you know read every question, and I just felt awkward doing it. And I was always yeah. You know, and I was always like, you know, mispronouncing certain words, and I was just like, okay, I'm gonna just bite the. Bu- I'm just gonna have them say, uh, tell them, you know, bite the bullet. Either do my, sh- either come on the show or not. And right. you know, so I stopped after three. Uh, the first one I remember d- doing an email with was the um, the uh, old porn star Georgina Spelvin, who you may remember from Police Academy. She gives the blowjob in the podium. Oh my goodness. Yeah, and I then did. she went on to porn. Well, she was in porn before that for years. She was doing it for about twenty years um, when she did um, that movie, and I think she had just retired, as a matter of fact. And um, so I did an email interview with her and stuff, and then um, I did Joe Bob Briggs not too long after that. And I'm thinking about emailing um, his personal assistant on my other email pretending to be someone else to actually get him on the show to promote the, the new season of his show. Because for some reason, ever since that email interview, she hasn't responded back to me. Huh. And then I did one with Judith O'Day, who played Barbara at Night of the Living Dead. And then a year later, I got her on, actually, and we did a, a, like a 20-minute interview or something. And she's an absolute sweetheart. So after that, I was just like, yeah, I'm not going to do any more email interviews. Yeah, it's not the same. You don't get the same kind of back and forth or rapport or anything like that. Yeah, plus you got, you know, listeners going, how arrogant does this person have to be to, like, you know, answer questions in, in an email, you know? And I don't think that they are, but I'm, but just, like, I, I know that's the thought process of, of the listeners. Oh, uh-huh. You know? Uh-huh. Right. Right. I've I've been binge watching a lot of. Um, do you remember that show, Out of This World? Yes, I do remember that show. I think I I'm not sure if I ever watched it, but I do remember it. Yeah. Who knows? You probably auditioned for it. <laughs> probably, I have probably. I'm trying to get um, the girl who plays Evie on the show, Maureen Flanagan. Um, um, she, she got out of the business. Um, but, um, she's out there and, um, I just love, I just love now. She, oh, what is she doing? I can't remember. I can't remember. I think she's on the lecture circuit or something along those lines oh. and stuff. But, but yeah, it was her, Donna Pescal from Saturday Night Fever and the great, the late, great Doug McClure. Oh. Yeah. Doug McClure? Yeah, I've interviewed his daughter, Tawny. It's one of my most downloaded episodes because she talked about her Me Too experiences. Mm. And there was many of them, she told me. Mm-hmm. She's a great well, lady. Well, I had a, uh, I was just looking through, I have, a, I have a writer friend that was going a reading of his pilot for my class uh, mm. in a couple of weeks. And I was trying to find for him because he's a first-time writer, but he's a very intelligent guy and he's you know, wanting to hear his stuff read. And so I was going through to try and find a breakdown, which is what actors get, you know, when they have an audition. And it's basically a breakdown of the project and then a breakdown of the rules they're casting. Yeah. And so he had never seen one of those before. So as I was sending it to him, I was 
freaking this thing, and I was like, did I read it? It was called Satanic Panic, or something along those lines. And it was like a five-paragraph something about nudity in it. And I'm like, did I audition for this? I don't think I would have auditioned for it, but I don't know. And I'm reading all of these guidelines about, like, you will have to, you know, you like, like walking you through what your experience is going to be like. So they were so over the top with the, you know, the new guidelines and the new way that they do stuff. You know, because a lot of times they want to see if you if you're going to be new, they want to see if you've got, you know, you're missing a belly button or, <laughs> you know, whatever it is. Like you know, you. you you've got a huge scar or, you know, a lot of times they want to see what you look like. And a lot of times for print work, it's just the standard. You, you know, so you go in and you're in your underwear and the clients are in there and they're like, okay, try them in this. Okay, try them in that. All right, try her in this. Try them in that. Try it, you know. And, and they put, you know, you're just basically a mannequin. And you just stand there and you just try on clothes. So now everything's changed. So I was reading this thing, and it was so over the top with these, like, you will never be alone. You will be with someone of the same sex. You will be there, you know, um, basically trying to soothe you into feeling like nothing scandalous is going to happen here right. during this audition. And blah, blah, blah. And I hadn't even remembered that I had read for this thing. Uh, obviously, I didn't get it, but... <laughs> um, I I don't even remember if I auditioned, honestly. I don't think I even sent it to it, but I think it was a self tape and I don't think I sent it on time or I don't think I sent it in. But it's just interesting bringing it back to the Me Too thing is that so overly cautious about it because back in the mm-hmm. day, it was not, it would not be out of this world, <laughs> out of this world, it would not be out of this world for someone to be taking in taken into the restroom and the clients want to see what you look like in your brief. Say it's for Baywatch. Or say, I'm not saying Baywatch should this. Please don't quote me on that. I'm mm-hmm. just saying, like, something where you have to be in a bathing suit. Yeah. And they want to see what you look like in a bathing suit. Right. So, usually they'll tell you, I mean, I've been on auditions where they're like, wear a bathing suit under your clothing. Well, technically, that's a bra and undies that you're wearing in front of who knows how many people for a callback on something. And, you know, they, they got people on satellite that are watching in and, you know, all this kind of stuff. So it's not that unheard of in this business where they want to see what you look like without clothes on. But now it's like a whole new ball game, you know. Mm-hmm. I think it'd be great if they paid you just you without clothes on, but that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You've been paying me well, an extra whatever for that second callback, or you want me to be naked. You know, I think they'll be a little bit more inclined to be in it, and so just, you know, I'm just kidding. That's never going to happen. Well, if you if you did audition for that and you didn't get it, you probably intimidated them by your intelligence. Yeah, I mean, that could that that could be the only explanation, <laughs> you know. I can't think of another. I mean, yeah, that's all I can think of too. Is that I'm just too smart. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. Yeah, uh, I don't care. I have my modesty left the building a long time ago. <laughs> and, you know, running around naked, but you know, you got to, you got to. I mean, there's so many times. Or, you know, you, you at a wardrobe fitting, you book the job, and then half the room's like, oh, that's awful on her. Oh, take that off. She looks like a blob. <laughs> you have to literally just take that out of your brain. Like, they didn't just call me a blob to be me. That's just how they felt. So then they put me in something else, and I put something else. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's the one. She looks fantastic. And you're like, okay, great. But you have to be able to disconnect yourself mm-hmm. from all of that. Stuff. It's a tough business. It's really tough. That's why I, I force parents don't add to it because it's hard enough as it is. 
you're the soft place they need to fall. And if you're criticizing them all the time, where are they going to fall? Nowhere. They have nowhere to go. Your mom, you know. It's tough for moms, too. So it's, it's a... You, you got to be a certain personality to be able to handle being a kid actor and then grow up to be a somewhat sane adult actor who still works, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, just... A lot of people are like, oh, yeah, yeah, it's me when you just see me. Like, did you see me on Mad Men? Did you see me on... Well, I don't say that, of course, because I've always been pretty... Um... A lot of people, some of my friends were like, I didn't even know you were an actress. I'm like, I don't leave with that. It's not. Yeah. My role. Some people do. Some of my friends do. Yeah. They want they want people to watch. That's why. Yeah. I mean, I want people to watch too, but you know, I'm not going to leave. I just never really been my my way. You're not a a, a malignant uh, nar- narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> Really funny. I've not thought of it that way. That's too funny. That's the only, that's, that's the only one I can think of. <laughs> this one. Oh, is it nice? Should make a t-shirt. Yeah. But, well, it came from a Rush song. Um, oh, I love Rush. Yeah, I, it was an instrumental, and I think they got a Grammy for it or a nomination at least. Oh, so that was the only thing that was out of Getty's brain or whatever. Or Neil Peart. Yeah. I, I I got to see them on their last tour. Um, I had just gotten out of the hospital from my accident the month before, and uh, me and my best friend went to go see them um, at the uh, San Jose Arena, and they just, oh my God, it was the best concert I've ever been to. And you, you would think with guys in their 60s, you know, it would be a terrible show. It's like, yeah, they're done. No, no, no. I mean, they could, they could, they could probably play when they're 100 years old if they wanted to. They're that good. I mean, Rush is just beyond when it comes to talent. Mm-hmm. Beyond. And we just lost Neil yeah. Peart, too. And mm-hmm. it's sad, but it's like, you know, I mean, they, they said that they were never they were never going to uh, get back together again, that they were just done, you know, because their bodies were worn out and stuff. But it's still pretty sad because now they've lost uh, both of their drummers because they had another one before him. Uh, for the the first six years, and then they had the first album and first tour with him, and then Neil Peart came on on the second album, and halfway through the first tour. Oh wow! Well. Yeah. Well, he had he had di- so great. The, uh, the first drummer had diabetes. That's why uh, he had to quit the band. Uh, that's a tough one. My brother has diabetes. Yeah. Struggles with that. Yeah, the first time um, that you and I talked, I had just had blood work done a couple weeks before, and then the, the very next week, I found out my blood sugar was really high, and I had to go on a diet. I've lost 24 pounds so far. That's amazing. It's so hard when you have to change everything. I mean, I, I get it. I can relate because I've had some similar, and I don't have diabetes, but I've had to change my diet, like no dairy, you know, Nothing. I mean, nothing that tastes good can I have. I can't. I can't eat anything that tastes good. First of all, so, <laughs> yeah, that's a bummer. But uh, changing the whole way you, you eat is a whole it's a whole life changer. So proud of you. Good for you. Thanks. Um, in two thousand seven, I lost one hundred and thirty pounds. Holy moly! And it was easier then because I was thirteen years younger, and I I didn't have metal in my leg from an accident, so I could I could. <laughs> I could bust my ass back then, and now it's just a long struggle to get the rest of the weight off, but I'm going to do it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you're on your way. Wow. And this will be the last time I will ever be obese. I just, you know, they, they told me when I got back um, from my accident that I was going to get depressed and, and everything, and I was going to gain weight and stuff, and they, they were right, you know. And uh-huh. I didn't mean to. I didn't mean to get this heavy, but... I did, and I didn't even realize it. Yeah, I mean, well, I'm sorry, but you're doing great now, so that's what counts. Yep, it's it's a. It neat. is hard when you get an accident. I've had an accident this year, I've had some health problems, and things like that. Nothing, you know, 
life-threatening, but definitely life-changing. I know the stuff that uh, we talked about in Messenger last night. It just it, it touched yeah. my heart. It it really did. And because you know I oh. I've seen friends who've gone th- who've gone through that stuff, and it's just it's it's not fair. You know. It's not fair, but you know, it could be ten times worse, and I, all I have to do is it's up to me to change certain things. And I mean, yeah, it's, it's like my friend goes, Oh, so you're on the rich white girl diet. And I'm like, Yeah, but too bad. And I go back and be like, Can I get the poor girl diet, please? Thank you. You know, I mean, it doesn't matter. That was a. a, a Single a, moms are never rich, so, you know. Now, uh, George Carlin uh, said that uh, anorexia was, was the, was the uh, rich girl diet. Yeah. God, he was brilliant. Yeah. Wow. That's tough. Yeah. I, I won't even repeat what he said, but it was funny. Oh, my God. I never really got, I, I don't think I've heard too much of his gender stuff. Uh, it's more political stuff, but I. Oh, no, he's not. Respond to it he was me. never sexist, that guy, but he said something that would probably be misconstrued as sexist today, but it, it, it really wasn't. He was just, you know satirizing the, the stereotypes of, of, of rich women, sure. you know? Sure. Yeah. I wonder who he would have voted for uh, for president, uh, for he quit, anybody. He quit voting. He, vote? he quit voting after 1972. I know that. Okay. okay. Yeah. He said after McGovern, he couldn't vote for anybody. about so many things. I wonder what he would have to say today. Oh, he'd be having a field day. I, I did a radio show with his brother about five years ago, and he told me just, just the way his, his brother would respond to today. You know, uh, Trump had just announced that he was running um, when I talked to him, right? And mm-hmm. he was responding to all the sexist stuff that Trump was saying, you know? And, mm-hmm. and he said... You know, I love I love Andrew Dice Clay, but what Donald Trump is doing is taking his act and put and applying it to politics, and he really needs to shut up. <laughs> That's hilarious. Yeah. Kind of true. <laughs> yeah, and even I've heard Dice say it himself in interviews. Oh, that guy! He was great in sixteen, uh, not sixteen candles, and pretty big. Pretty in pink. And that's where he developed his little uh, cigarette trick thing that he does. Yeah. Yep. I, I, with the lighter and the, hey, oh, hey, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's, where, that's where comedy magic started in that little scene, mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. What other John Hughes well, movies do you like? That's pretty much it. I, 60, uh, I'm sorry. Pretty in Pink will be my all-time favorite forever. I did like Some Kind of Wonderful. I thought that was fantastic. Mm-hmm. Um, all of them. I, I was up for actually the daughter in um, Some Kind of Wonderful, but I didn't put that. Um, the, ro- the, the, the role that Maddie Corman got? Uh, probably. Or Tr- was her name Trish? I can't, I don't remember. You know, I, once I've gone on the audition, not book the job, I just kind of, it just goes out of my head. I mean, there's there's stuff I've done that I've never even seen. Not not because I think, you know, whatever. I just it's the job's done. I don't know. Her her character's name was Laura. I don't remember the character's name. It was one of the sisters of Eric. Stoltz. Yes, that's her. That's her. She I was. I don't know if I was the older, if it was the older girl, or if it was one of the the younger girl. Was it Candace Cameron? Candace Cameron. Uh, Candace oh, she's Cindy. Younger daughter. She was Cindy. She her. Yeah, she was Cindy in um, Some Kind of Wonderful. Yeah, it may have been that girl. I was all right in between because Candace is a little bit younger than me. She was a couple years younger. Mm-hmm. And the other girl is like a lot older than I am. Yeah, um, Maddie's probably about six years older than you. Yeah, and I always, because I was so tall... I always had to go in on rules that were older. Mm-hmm. So I don't know with that particular movie which role it was that I went in for. I'm not quite sure. But yeah. I loved what she did in it, what the older daughter did. I thought she was great. Yeah. Um, I couldn't tell you if that was the role or not. I don't I don't know. I don't remember. 
Yeah. Um, or was it less than zero? I don't know. It was one of those. Less, less than zero. zero. <laughs> yeah. It was okay. kind of weird. Uh, mm-hmm. It was it was kind of weird when John Hughes switched uh, from teen comedy to family comedy. Yeah, with the duck and all that. With Uncle Buck and Home Alone and um, Dutch. Oh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. Who who married? Not Tia Leone. What's the other one from Some Kind of Wonderful? I worked with her on something. I can't remember what it was now. Let me find out. Um, Leah Thompson. There's her. There's Molly Hagen. Leah Thompson. From Back to the Future. Yes, I, I, I met her at my very first Comic Con, and she was just a, a delight. Oh, she's lovely. Yeah, she's very sweet. Yeah. Yeah, I enjoyed. I worked with her for a few days on some show that she was doing, but she married the guy who did the Duck movies. The oh. Howard the Duck. Oh yeah, she was in Howard the Duck. Yeah. She married the director. She married the director of some kind of wonderful Howard Deutsch. That's it. And he did the Duck movies. Yes. She was in the Duck movies. And I think they've been together for, for all this time. I mean, hey, it is to them. It's hard to keep a relationship going. I remember, what's her name? Um, the one from, uh, oh, gosh, you got to help me out here. Um, the, um, the Fast Times. Fast Times Rich Monday. Phoebe, Phoebe Case, who married to Kevin Klein. So she's like, yeah. she's like, listen, uh, there's only one asshole per family. So I decided to give it up for Kevin. <laughs> Basically, she was like, I'm giving up my career so Kevin can pursue his because the limit is one asshole per family. <laughs> <laughs> I used to do a bit about about Phoebe yeah. Cates. I used to do a bit about Phoebe Cates and that whole um, scene in Fast Times when uh, Judge Reinhold's jerking off to her. Do you remember that? Uh-huh. I used to do a whole bit about that on stage, and only people who like knew the movie actually got it. Um, who doesn't know that movie? Oh, there's some people out there who don't. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Phoebe Cates. Yeah, Phoebe Cates though. But like, I heard she lives in New York, and she like, she like, I think she owns like a clothing store or something. Does she? Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. I have been making furniture during my quarantine, other than being a little under the weather. I've been making furniture. So, that's fun. And painting. You've been doing a lot of that? Uh, yeah. What? What's that? Yeah, I've been just, I've been procrastinating to uh, write, the, to write these uh, scripts that I want to write and stuff. But every time, like, I come up with a good idea for something, I want to do something else that I come up with after. And it just, uh, it, it drives me crazy. Like, okay, what, what, what do I do, you know, first? Well... You know, I'm also a writer too, and there's many, many of, many of plays, many of screenplays that I need to be writing that I've been wanting to write. And you know what? Mm-hmm. It's not common. It's not common. I'm just gonna fill my space up with creativity until that inspiration hits, and then it will flow. That's just how I look at it. That's how I go about it. Um, you know. There's a lot of things I should be doing uh, writing-wise. Uh, I'm not. Mm-hmm. But, you know, there's other things coming out of it. I'm learning how to do other things. But the day I stop learning how to do stuff is the day it's time to say, okay, it's been fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, um, yeah, I've just, I've, I've been just, um, making lists of like who I want to reach out to the interview and stuff. And, 
right when quarantine started, I was just over flooded and overwhelmed with people to talk to. And I did. And now the last two weeks or so, it's been very, um, it's been very, um, very lean. I, I think a lot of people are just, you know, hit hard with this whole thing, you know. Do you think people are just, like, in the middle of trauma, like they're not feeling like talking? Or yeah. they would think now would be the time to do it? I think a lot of people are, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I could be now wrong. Be the time. Yeah, I, I could be wrong. I don't know, but it, that's just my theory and stuff. Um, I had one guy say to me, um, let, let, "Let's let's do it uh, when everything calms down." And I'm thinking, "When's that going to be? It, 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 we could be we could all be gone soon, you know." You could, but you know what? Onto the next. There's plenty of people you can talk to if they're willing to do it. Yeah, and they're like, I said, they're not you know, when we're off, you know, I know police. You know, that are living different lifestyles now that I'm sure would be more than willing to talk to you if you um, were interested in talking to them. So. Oh, there's certain people. Yeah. yeah. There's certain people. Oh, my God. They just, you know, they, they try to, like, pull the bullshit card on me to, like, you know, I haven't acted yeah. in this many years or something, right? And then I, I usually surprise them with a, a link to an, to an interview I heard them do not too long ago, and then they never respond back because <laughs> I caught them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know why people would say no. It's one of those things. I mean, you know, because we would always people that don't like us, we're never going to get Yeah. But, you know, you reach out to the ones, and the ones that respond, hey, you know, get on them. And, um... You're getting what you need for your show, and you're progressing with your show, and it seems like you are. Yeah, I mean, just I, I have this year alone. I have interviewed people that I, I I tried to get two, three years ago, and I didn't think I was going to, and then I did, and I'm just oh my god, just flabbergasted. I can't believe that I that I was able to, you know. From the quarantine, or from just this past year in general. Just this past year in general, yeah. Oh, like a month ago, I talked to uh, Michael Boogaloo Chambers from the Breakin' Movies, and mm-hmm. to me, he's the greatest dancer ever. And I just couldn't believe it uh, when I was able to get in touch with him. He, his his website is brand new, and his Facebook page and Twitter pages are all brand new and stuff. He's like put himself back into the spotlight after being bitter for a long time, and now he's humble again because. Um, I, when I was researching to interview him, I heard an interview he did back in 2009 in which he was just bitter and angry and stuff, but now he's in a good place. I really had a great conversation with him. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, most people can't, you know. <laughs> Some people can go from being humble to bitter and never go back, and I've uh, seen that time and time again on here, really. Yeah, well, it's too bad. I mean, you know, this, this, this is not to definitely gamble, and you do it because you love it, and you just keep rolling with the punches. Mm-hmm. My only advice, you know, pick yourself up, dust yourself off, and start all over again. Yeah. I talked to uh, one actress. Funny as it is. But... Yeah, I talked to one actress I'm friends with, and she's like, she's like, we're actors, and I never said that we weren't bitter. <laughs> yeah, we're born bitter. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, there's we've all got a little bit of something in us. Yeah. Yeah. It's okay though. I'm not, I, I I'm okay with where I'm at. I mean, I have lovely health funds that you know put things in perspective and have children, and, you know, or or babies, or whatever it might be. Or, what kind of babies? <laughs> what, me? Yeah, you said what kind of babies? Fur, fur babies. Fur babies. Oh, uh, animals. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Animals. Pets. Yeah. Yeah, oh, we have a cat um, that we got back in October, and she's got personality. This this She's half Bengal, and, oh, my God, she, she is strong. She could open my door. 
She opens she opens my door, crawls right onto my bed, and looks through the window. And I just cannot believe it. it it's like my grandmother's reincarnated in her. That's so cool. That's cool. We just got a cat, too. Yeah. Um, and she is a princess. She is the sweetest thing I've ever... I've had black cats. So, uh, I've always had black cats. I don't know why. I just think they look cool. Anyway, um, but this cat is like... I mean, she's as cool as I could, you know, down to line. Yeah. But she will literally reach out and touch her face as gently and she's furry. Mm-hmm. It's all soft. And you can see, you can feel the claw, but it's never aggressive. Right. Like the, 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 um, the nail. It's never aggressive. It's always just, will you look at me? Do you love me? Will you pet me? It's just, and I've had tons of cats in my mm-hmm. lifetime, and this cat is something else. She's a doll. I mean, literally a doll. Mm-hmm. And I fostered her, so I got her, and she's five and a half. Um, but my son and her are bonded, and they are just um, he's in the closet too. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. We, there's this there's this black cat that lives across the way. He is mean and ferocious, and he <laughs> is he's full of testosterone. And every day he's trying to pick her up. You know, he's, he's, he, yeah, he's, he's trying to mate with her and she hisses at him and she, the other day she smacked him in the face with her claw and my mother saw it and I, I was, I heard it. I, I didn't see it. I heard it. And my mother was like, yeah, girl, you, t- you tell him, you tell that pervert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's hilarious. Oh, I'm so Yeah. She just flopped, pet me, loved me. And she's aggressive and needy, but not to the point where you're irritated with her. Mm-hmm. But if you say no, she stops. She's uh, something else. I mean, it, it still doesn't get out of her. Oh. That's just me. And I have a dog, too. So I'm just pretty much an animal person altogether. So. Yeah, we had gotten permission from the landlord to get a dog, and we ended up getting a cat instead just uh, because um, somebody that my mom knew was giving away kittens, and she just, out of desperation, she wanted a pet, so we got the cat, you know. But uh, we're eventually going to get a dog, you know. Um, But we we love this cat. I mean, she is something special, and she's very loving you know i mean she can be an aggressive bitch like like the like the next cat but she is just very loving and very protective of us oh that's so cute i have a chihuahua and he she thinks she is uh, a pit bull when it comes to anybody trying to knock on the door or walk by she just comes up barking like she's gonna take somebody down and she's all Animals are precious. They're the best. All right, well, if there's anything else, uh, you know, so with all this stuff going on my end over here, just uh, throw some self tapes and I wanted to... enjoy the rest of the quarantine and live in my kids and have to live it. Well, I wanted to ask you, Allison, what would you say is your best personality trait?
yeah, I would say that's one of your best qualities. I mean, you know, the, the beginning of that story I told you, I mean, you were laughing until the horrific stuff came, you know? Yeah. So I could, yeah. so I could see, I could see that. De- definitely. I, my, my best personality traits are like, you know, I'm, I'm very empathetic, you know? I care about people. Um, I have no filter, and it, it takes an awful lot to offend me. And I think that's why so many people in Hollywood like me that I've talked to. Because I'm so real. Uh, bridges are a little bit harder for me, but I will tell you this. I interviewed a guy the other day that I actually had a grudge against for a few years because he wasn't nice to me at a convention, but he showed me a side to him that I didn't expect to see, and, and you know, I didn't even bring up, you know, what he had done or anything, but I just had this, like, self-healing mode of, like, okay, I forgive, I'm just going to let it go. I feel a lot better, you know, and I was I was on the, the, the path of forgiving, which is why I reached out to him in the first place to uh, to do the show and everything, because uh, I, I wanted to know more about him and stuff, and yeah, I feel fantastic. Yeah, I wanted to ask you. You uh, you told me before that uh, someone was cutting wood next door or something. Every Monday morning, between the hours of 8 and 11, we have weed whacker guys outside waking me up. You know, I like to sleep in, and so on Mondays, it, it's hard for me to sleep in because of those weed whacker guys. And I was hoping that quarantine would affect their job, and it hasn't. <laughs> Public so much. 
Uh, I got that here too. It's, 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 the, it's the leaf blowers. Yeah. And it seems to go on for hours when it goes on at my place anyway. Yeah. They don't just get it done, one and done, and then they're out. It's not like the pool guy. It's like they seem. It seems like it takes them all day to go leave them out, and then they're back to the pool. Yeah, for the first 14 years that I was growing up, we lived in a house, and we never had to deal with that. But ever since we've been living in apartments since 1997, we have had to deal with that on Monday mornings. It is just insane. <laughs> it really does suck. It really does suck. I, I don't know why. Uh, they, it, I, don't, I don't know if these machines they use are from, I don't know, parts together from 1940, you know, it's like, you know, that's just bad for the environment. You know what, it, it's terrible, I, but I feel your pain. I definitely feel your pain because I have the same situation here too. Yes. Yeah. They suck. <laughs> yeah. They totally suck. They suck. Have, have you been having your uh, groceries delivered to you? No, actually I've been going because I have well, yeah, I just go. I go, I, you know, I set up. I got the mask, I got the gloves, I got the hand sanitizer stuff, I clean the basket, I do all that. I don't touch anything. I, I, you know, I follow the rules on that. I don't go very often, mm-hmm. but, um, you know, I get the stuff I need to get, and then I have to be on this now very, very strict diet for the next few weeks that is very specific food. So looking on line will take me hours to find out what I need to eat. So it's just easier for me just to go to the store, pick up some things. Okay, I know I can eat that for the next week. I'm good. Okay, good. I'm done. I don't know. So that's pretty much it um, when it comes to that. Sometimes I go to people's houses for private. Um, and the parents are cool, and you know, I gear up for that too. Mm-hmm. Um, I do have another side job that works with autistic kids, so I have <coughs> children. Oh, you, you know, you know, I have Asperger's syndrome. No, I did not know that. I do, yes. Um, well, I, I have a, it's a little bit of that. Well. When I was in school, I was diagnosed with um, a learning disorder, but it was never properly um, it was never properly diagnosed. But I, I think I have Asperger's. I, I, I definitely have the signs of it. You think you do? What are the signs? Um, just you know, um, not the... out things inappropriately, or oh yeah. Really... Well, I've been doing that my whole life. <laughs> the the guardian. <laughs> yeah. Regarding the situation, yeah, um, there's that. There's um, just not very good socially. Um, just um, okay. nervousness, shyness, and, and all this other stuff that I, I I don't even know. I have to look up everything, but I know I definitely have it. Well, well, a lot of people have it, and, and it does end diagnosed a lot of the time. And I usually work with kids who, you know are having some issues, whether it's in school or, or, you know, at home or with other siblings or, you know, and we come up with a game plan and it's all play-based. So it's um, HIPAA, which is a certain kind of um, curriculum or uh, guidelines that you follow. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our job is to help them socially, which is really the main thing, how to take turns, how to, you know, I mean, things that kids with autism have more difficulty with. So that's really what, what I do as a side kind of um, job with my, you know, my sociology degree and helping kids with those things, something I like doing, so. Yeah, you just, you have a heart of gold, Allison. You really do. Ah, you're sweet. You really do. Thanks, yeah, you really do, you know. I mean, you just... 
you, I mean, uh, so many child actors have grown up to be so fucked up, as we talked about earlier with the with the Corys, you know. But yeah. you just your your parents did a, a great job. Yeah. Well, thanks for that. Thank you. Yes, um, she's still here. Would appreciate that. Yes, they brought you up to uh, respect other people and help people, and that's just a, a, a quality to have to remi- to to admire, you know. Ah, thank you so it's, much. Of course, it's it's, it's it's remarkable, you know, yeah. and you know I've I've met people who just <clears throat> are not are not like that at all, you know, and I don't know, you know, if it's genetic or it's their environment, but. It's really, really sad. Yeah, it is sad. I come against it a lot. I come up against it a lot. And I'm always constantly shocked at where people's priorities are. So, I know, superficialism. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's true. It's true. I mean, I can certainly uh, support you to be a little bit more selfish and a little bit more, you know, whatever. But, you know, I do my thing and I do what, my, what, what I feel is right. And that's what I do. So, Would you say that um, what you lack for in some areas you make up for in others? Probably. Maybe. I don't know. I try. That's pretty much all I can do. Is I try. I try to do the right thing. You know, I, I take people for who they are, and that's uh, all I can do. I mean, it's not my job to change people. My job is to just be a good human being. So, mm-hmm. and I bring a lot of that into my work too. You know, I, I bring a lot. I try to bring a lot of that philosophy into my work, mm-hmm. and then looking at characters and stories, and you know, and when you're playing a different character, you have to pay homage and service to that character and the story that's being told, the story that's being written, and, and live in the world that, that they're in. And it's, it's not something that's, you know, not necessarily something I would choose for myself. Who cares? I have to find the similarities in a character before I can attack, you know, a character. Before I can go after it and really give, give all I have. So, I try not to be too judgy. Then that goes over into work, too. Yeah. I, I mean, tell you how many times I get people that are like, I would never play this character because I would never be a stripper. I'm like, I don't care. <laughs> you think strippers are one dimensional people? And that's it? No. There's a million things as to how they got where they are and why they are where they're at. And maybe they love the job. Even the actors who are sociopaths, I think the reason they pull off the role really, really well is because they're they're exposing their pain of of the the, the way of, of what people of what they wish people understood about them, you know, um, behind the the uh, the, so, the, um, the lack of empathy that they have, if that makes sense. The lack of empathy that they as the actor have. Yes, the the ones that are you know the ones that that are just you know narcissistic and full of themselves and mean you know the stars right. the movie stars you know mm-hmm. I think that they exposed you know their private pain through their characters you know okay. and that's the only place they're going to expose it because they don't open up to anybody when they're um, off stage. Hmm. I could I could go along with that. Sure. <laughs> I mean, that, that's the one thing that being an artist is what's so great about it, is that you can take any, I mean, I'm going, I'm, I'm sliding away from this to path part, but you can take the great pains and troubles and trials and tragedies that happen in your life and 
you can use them in your work. And, you know, call it method, call it whatever, but it really is an essential part of being an artist. And that's why I've been grateful that I've been able to be an artist for so long, is that I can bring those things. You know, why suffer if it's not for a reason? Well, shit, remember how I feel on this day when my mother passed away of a horrifying disease? Okay, I will be able to use this at some point, and then the pain will be for naught. You know, it won't be for naught. Right. So I'm lucky in that way. I feel blessed and honored that I can be an artist and be able to use those things. And have you played a stripper? <laughs> I've not played a stripper. I don't know why. I just haven't. You, know. you didn't audition for Showgirls? <laughs> I did not audition for Showgirls. Um, no, I did not. Um, I don't know if Shirley had that job or if anybody auditioned. I don't really know what went down with that, but that ended up being a big, big, um, not so great for her. Yeah. Well, Gina Gershon is great in it, too. Gina Gershon. Yeah, I've always liked her. She's pretty great. Yeah. Now, I would love to have a chance to play more of that kind of a thing. Not necessarily a showgirl, but, you know, I don't know, certain times I get opportunities for certain things. And, you know, other times I don't. So, I don't know, maybe it's my management, maybe it's what they... Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I, 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 I mean, in, in one on one hand, I can see you do it, but on another, I, I, I just don't know. I, I, I mean, I'm not saying that you couldn't do it though, but I just, I, I'm just, I'm just trying to picture that. <laughs> My dollar. Oh, it's right over here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, so we can speak yourself. That's okay, honey. We got the right person at all. Right under the nipple under my belly button. <laughs> <laughs> my mom was saying something about that earlier today. She said that, you know, she's like she's af- she's afraid that, that her that her nipple's gonna meet her belly button in the next year or so. <laughs> oh geez. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I got a story to share that I forgot about. Um, I have a friend about a week before quarantine started. Um, she had uh, one of her ovaries removed. Yeah, it was something along the lines of a blood clot or something down there. Um, I'm not too sure about it, right? But she was she called me up and she was crying to me about it. And she just was talking about all the pain she was going through and stuff. And I said something that made her laugh. I said, "You, you know those um, those lollipops you used to get at the um, at the at the at the carnival? Uh, the candy is like swirled on a stick." Uh huh. I told her. I said, "I bet that's what her her fallopian tubes look like now." <laughs> she cracked up. She she went from she went from tears to just instant laugh laughing tears, you know, 
Yeah, and I felt so good that I did that, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I should I should I should uh, tell that story in my stand up. Yeah. <laughs> well, Allison, I mean, um we've um made it to 2 hours and this has been so much fun. I'm so glad that uh you came back on and we got to shoot the shit. <laughs> Absolutely, and um, hopefully next time uh, we talk, um, you'll have um, a new project or something that uh, that we, we can talk about, you know. And um, I want to talk in I want to talk in messaging though about um, about uh, you um, helping me get guests though. Oh sure. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. So, yeah, you give me a give me a wish list, or uh, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it on Messenger. We'll figure it out. Yeah, we'll we'll talk about it on there. You know, you know, whoever you know and stuff, and we we'll we'll, we'll get all that squared away and stuff. But um, I hope uh, you have a good night over there, and uh, take care of that son of yours, and mm-hmm. keep your head up because you are a strong, amazing person. My pleasure. Thank you, hun, and have yourself a great night. All right, you too. Okay. I'll see you later. Okay. okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, there you have it. Allison Croft. A, she is sweetheart. I love Allison. She is the most awesome, straightforward, very honest, strong lady that there is. I just adore her. You can't get much better than Allison Croft. All you producers out there, fucking hire her once quarantine is over because she will not disappoint. She is talented. Um, If you like this video, everyone, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Add me as a friend on Facebook. Join my Tommy Kovac comedian page on Facebook. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram and all that fun stuff. Well, that's all time we have this week on Splat from the Past. Until next time, this is Tommy Throwback Kovac saying, there's no shame in living in the past because the present sucks. Later, dudes.